Thank you, Upana uh, Sairam. Uh, everyone, I offer my humble pronouns to the divine lotus feet. I pray to Swami that he bless us with his presence and speak through all of us today. Uh, what a what a beautiful uh, start to the program. It's always wonderful to see the videos of Swami and the songs. It's put me in a different space. I'm, I'm trying to come back to this presentation uh, after seeing those beautiful videos and the, and the meditation. Um, I'm very grateful to Sister Panna for conducting this Connecting the Dots. We're now really inspired by her relentless focus on getting us all together. Um, there is so much of uh, knowledge and experience uh, in this group that's gathered here today, I'm sure. Um, and uh, what I was going to share is simply just a perspective um, and hopefully just engender some more curiosity in all of you to uh, you know, go off and think about what it means to in your own respective uh, classes and um, in, in, with your students. Um, you know, it's always good to remind ourselves uh, with with Swami's quotes, as always, and and all of you get to also participate in the same quiz I asked Aparna. Uh, what is the end of wisdom? Please do post in the chat. You get ten seconds. End of wisdom. End of wisdom, end of wisdom. At least we got one correct answer. The end of wisdom is freedom, according to Swami. What is the end of education? End of education is character. Good. I won't ask the other two uh, <laughs> uh, because... It's good. So it's great. You know, all of you obviously are very knowledgeable experts in this in this uh, arena. So yeah, the end of wisdom is freedom. Swami says the end of culture is perfection. The end of knowledge is love. End of education is character. This is the first discourse in Summer Showers 1972, which is the first Summer Showers that Swami had, and he's talking to students. The first chapter. Uh, the, and he says in the same in the same discourse, there is a desire on the part of all of us to acquire these four: wisdom, culture, knowledge, and education, and reach the true goals of these. That is freedom, perfection, love, and character. But students should realize that if these qualities are not properly utilized, then they cannot call themselves students. So, as students and future citizens of this country, Swami is telling the students. You have the responsibility for shaping the future of this country. You may be thinking, and Swami is saying, there are only about 300 students from this vast country of India attending this course. And we all might think there's only like you know, <laughs> five or six students in my class. And you may be wondering, you know, are these kids really going to change the future of this world? And Swami is saying, you may be wondering how such a small number can do anything to rectify and alter the terrifying phases which life in this country has assumed. You know, this is 1972. It seems very relevant even now. My dear students, there may be hundreds and thousands of soldiers to be trained, but there will be only a small number of teachers to train them. These are the commanders and leaders. He's talking about the students, not us. <laughs> Taking this example, even though there are thousands of students in this country, you, as leaders must get the training you require to train the many thousands of others in this country. You know, I always remind myself that this is Swami's program. These are Swami's students and he's got a plan. The fact that they are in SSC is because he wants them to be in SSC. We are purely instruments and we are simply doing Swami's bidding. And so I, I remind myself of that, uh, because, uh, because these students have amazing roles to play in the future. And they are going to be the leaders of this country. They're going to change society. They're going to do amazing things. So that, that keeps me humble. Uh, and I get to learn a lot from the students uh, as well. So I'm going to share some thoughts on group four specifically. Um, you know, group four is an interesting time. Um, Students have 
uh, come. Uh, hopefully, most of them have been through the other three groups. Some of sometimes, you know, there will be new students who join right at group four, but typically they have transitioned from group three to group four. And, you know, in my experience, you know, it's an interesting transitional phase for them. Um, you know, they are definitely a lot more focused on a bunch of extracurricular activities. They have a lot of pressure in, in high school, um, you know, and that causes a lot of sort of time management issues for them. And, you know, one of the things that I and uh, uh, my co-teacher, we try to, day one, you know, we uh, we have this discussion with the students in terms of why, uh, you know, why are you in this SSC class? What is making you come to the class? And uh, it can't be anymore because my parents want me to come. That cannot be the reason. Uh, or, you know, I'm coming here because my friends are coming here, right? So we try to despite all of their various pressures on their time, they're still able to make the time to come to the SSC class. It's got to be because they have a good reason. So we ask them that question and you get you will get many different answers, but it's good to hear that because you can keep coming back to those answers for those individual students in your class at different times during the year and different times during every week even sometimes. The other thing that you know I've noticed is that this is a time when they are developing a lot of independent thinking uh, and they are exposed to a lot of social issues. Um, you know, also they are connecting with uh, other students in class and they have a lot of opinions. They formulate uh, a lot of ideas. They have a lot of questions on everything. In fact, some of the things that they may have not questioned in group one, two or three, uh, they begin to question uh, now, which is good. It's not a bad thing. Uh, in group one, two, and three, you know, they just did what they were asked to do, but now they have questions and they will challenge some of those things that were taught. Uh, and especially in the context of what they see uh, in society and what they're being exposed to. And that's a great thing. Um, and, you know, usually uh, we go around asking the students really what is the challenges that they would like to see addressed. And everybody has different challenges that they are facing. And it's, it's a good context to have uh, and, and also an understanding of their needs and their aims, if you will. And then the other interesting thing is I've, I've realized that at this stage in group four, parents are also evolving the relationship with the children. Uh, you know, at what point do they sort of simply tell them to do this versus giving them the freedom to make their own minds. And there's always an interesting boundary there and parents are beginning and the children are beginning to adjust to that boundary. And that's an interesting conversation as well, especially with parents also. And, and as I said, there's more objecti objectivity and rationality in their, in their questions, in their thought process, um, and, and as opposed to just saying, okay, you know, this is what we need to do, great, we'll do it. No, they have a lot of thoughts about why, what's the reason to do this? Now, there are some students rarely, and this is a rare gift. You know, I find do, do find some students who have complete faith, uh, you know, that they don't question, they continue to do it. Uh, but, but many students do have a bunch of questions. But however, they're very eager. They really want to know more. They want to know more about Swami's teachings. They want to know exactly what he's saying. Why is he saying? How is it useful to me? Um, and, and in the past, they may not have had that level of curiosity. Uh, they just kind of listened and absorbed. Now they really want to dig in a little bit more. And that's, that's incredible because the more they put in the class, the more they get out of the class. And, and so this is a good thing to sort of dig in. Um, and again, we talked about this. How do his teaching, especially the value-oriented teachings, uh, they want to understand that before they will say, yeah, truth, love, right, conduct, nonviolence. You know, they'll just repeat it, five values, great. But what does it really mean? They still want to explore that. So this is this is an interesting phase in their lives. And, they, and they, this is just a, uh, my some of, sort of high level observations. And I'm sure all of you have many more, I'm sure, to add. But I'm just uh, giving some context from my perspective. 
So anyway, so so this for, for me, you know, you know, it results in a bunch of opportunities for engaging the students. Really understand their needs. What are they going through in their life right now? Many of them have slightly different uh, variations. Some of them have aims. Some of them want to do be this in college. They want to be this in life. They want this kind of, uh, you know, uh, they want to be in this kind of a profession. That's one thing. And then they have the idea of how to deal with good company, bad company. There are lots of questions in those areas. So really understanding, creating an open and friendly environment, sort of a safe environment for them to share whatever their challenges are, right? It, I think is important. It may take some time. Uh, I found that sometimes it takes like really year two before they really start opening up. Uh, but I think developing that relationship, that confidence and creating the right environment really helps, you know. Um, and uh, and then and taking that understanding and bringing the core concept of SSE, uh, right, in terms of how their needs and aims can be supported by these core SSE concepts. Uh, that's important, right? And we'll talk a little bit more about that. And also this whole objectivity and rational thing, it, it's, it's an interesting thing. They are now very, oh my God, very STEM oriented, whatever they have also all kinds of questions and reasoning and analytic analytical thinking and all that. It's all good, but it's also good to remind them that there are life is about both rational and irrational, right? The things like love and, you know, and we, and we can, the context I really see that might resonate with them is especially love of parents. Uh, there are irrational things that you can't really put an equation around. <laughs> and, and they need to understand that life is made up of both, right? Um, and then and then again, they have, as I said, eagerness to learn values. They want to also, everyone has, they're part of a team. They're doing something. Right, either as part of their curriculum or they're part of the extracurricular activities. Uh, you know, they are very curious about leadership. You know, we leveraging that because everything that Swami says in terms of five values and the sub values is all needed uh, to support leadership. So that is a, another great opportunity to engage with them. And then, you know, many times, you know, students will say, "I'm challenged with peer pressure." You know, my my friends are doing this. Uh, you know, I don't know if I should do that or not. So again, the peer pressure is simply a sim is, is symptomatic of uh, you not having your own decision making framework, right? And and if you don't have it, then you're going to be subject to somebody else's decision making framework. So kind of addressing that with look the values and the sub values and how to apply them essentially is a decision making framework. You know, you have to use these things to decide what you're going to do, how. And then how you help them through that uh, with some examples. Sometimes it's the most simplest examples. In the most simple situation, you have to apply the values. Then in difficult situations, you will learn to apply them as well. So uh, that's an opportunity to engage them because they're constantly making decisions and they don't know what's right or wrong. Uh, not, well, not everybody knows what's right or wrong. There are some black and white, but there's a lots of gray areas. They are constantly making decisions. So that's another opportunity to engage with them. Um, so having said all that, you know, we have found that these are the four goals for the group four uh, SSC class, right? It takes me in the, in, the, in the three years that we have time with the children, would love to see, uh, you know, continued focus on these four goals. First one is, the, is this devotion, the cultivation of devotion to God. They have learned this in group one, group two, group three. In group four, now they are challenging it. <laughs> like, what does that mean? What is devotion to God? I don't understand it, right? What does devotion mean? What does worship mean? There's so many questions that... Uh, that they should be raising, actually, and, and they will, which is great. And there are many methods that we can use to engage with students. And I've found a few, and I'll share with, with you some of them. One is in Prema Bahani, Swami very clearly describes the meaning of worship. You know, basically, the, here's what it is. Swami says that 
when you worship someone or something, you're attracted to the qualities of the object of worship. And then through the process of worship, you manifest those qualities in yourself. And then once you do that, the object of worship is no longer needed. So this is the definition that Swami gives in Premalai. Very simple. In fact, we all do it all the time, right? And the easiest example that I give is Kobe Bryant and, and, and Michael Jack and uh, Michael Jordan, which is, hey, Kobe Bryant worshiped Michael Jordan. Why? He wanted to be like Michael Jordan. So if you go to Kobe Bryant's bedroom, I haven't been there, but I'm challenged. I'm, I can tell you for sure. <laughs> he had pictures and posters of Michael Jordan everywhere. He's probably had videos on, of Michael Jordan he's been watching. He's reading books. He wants to meet him. He wants to touch him. He wants to play with him, right? He wants to dribble like him. He wants to whatever. At the end of it, what happened? He became like Michael Jordan, right? And then he manifested the same qualities, right? Um, so that's what it is. We do this all the time. So using, if you want to be the greatest exponent of human values, then the greatest <laughs> role model is Bhagavan Sri Satya Sai Baba, uh, the most documented avatar in, in history of humanity. So you can study his life. You can re read his books. You can watch his uh, discourses, listen to his discourses, uh, you know, and then you can see what it means to apply these values. So that's what devotion means. That's one method. The other method is also we talked about, hey, do you, devotion means love of God, love of something. And what does that mean? Well, do you love your mother? Yes, I do. What does that mean? <laughs> so you keep questioning and they go and they come to that point. Yeah, if a mother is not happy, I'm not happy. I want to do what my mother would, would, would like me to do. I want to please my mother. Okay, then you apply the same things to Swami. So these are a couple of techniques. And then we spend a lot of time on the nine paths of devotion, right? We spend literally like six months in the three-year time frame I'm talking about, um, right? Where why is listening to uh, the stories of God important or inspiring stories, right? It's, it's, it's easy. You can think about it. It is inspiring to listen to, to something. People listen to podcasts all the time and they get inspired. Listening is a first step. Why is repeating the name of God important, right? What, what, is it, what is in repeating words, right? And so, you know, so there are many good examples about it. There are good words, there are bad words. Who defines what's a good word? Who defines what's a bad word? You know, Swami always says that there is the unseen, which is massive, and then there's a scene, which is a small representative of the unseen. So when you repeat the word of God, the amount of energy, the kind of energy that's gone into it over millennia is so powerful that you actually tap into that energy when you repeat the word of God, because billions and billions of people over millions of years have repeated that word with a positive feeling. So when you repeat those words, you tap into that positivity. So there are ways in which you can dive into these nine paths of devotion. There'll be a lot of questions and a lot of back and forth. It's all very exciting. Second goal, study of Sai literature. Sai literature, answers to any question in your life is in Sai literature. Answer to any social problem is in Sai literature. Answer to any personal problem is in Sai literature. Everything is here. There's, you don't have to go You don't have to go anywhere else as a lifelong toolkit. They need to be able to go to the Sai literature throughout their lives. So we want that in the, in the three years that they develop a, a way to do this. So, the, so, so what we do is we usually pick a book, uh, you know, Wahini or Discourse or Summer Shower, something like that. And then we uh, divide it into, you know, each topic, each discourse is covering a particular topic. So we break it up into those topics, humility, or the topics are usually values or sub-values. And then we, the responsibility is this. Each student has to read that discourse, study that discourse, come prepared with comments, questions, and thoughts. 
Second, one of the students actually has to make a presentation uh, and that presentation will guide that class. Um, and then the, the, the amount of debate and questions that happens is great. You've got to in, encourage that. And then in the end, we assign another student who has to summarize the discussions for the next week. So we do this week after week after week and everybody goes around Robin, everybody gets a chance to do that. So it just helps them to get comfortable with reading sci literature. Now, there's a lot of other things that comes up, which is there are some foundational concepts that if you don't know, you know, then it becomes uh, hard to understand. Jivatma, Paramatma, Brahman, and Swami keeps bringing this up again and again. So I'll go into that a little later. But the sci literature, being comfortable with that, going to that is, is another goal. And I talked about decision-making framework using values. And again, uh, you know, it's 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 uh, using simple experiences. You know, every day we are making decisions, and we are not conscious about how we make the decisions. So, trying to get them conscious conscious about it, simplest things, right? Uh, because only only in simple environments, in a sort of a safe environment. You know, if you realize that, hey, I can actually apply values, then in a difficult environment, you will also learn to do that. It's hard to hypothesize in you know, difficult situations. I'll tell you, and maybe this is a dumb thing, but one of the simplest things I tell them is, hey, I invited you home, Mr. Student. I, I, I cooked a nice meal and you all are eating my meal and you just don't like, don't like how it tastes. <laughs> you know, and then I asked you, hey, how was the food? <laughs> and then I present uh, one of Swami's quotes, Satyam Bhriyat, speak the truth. Priyam Bhriyat, speak that which is loving. Na Bhriyat Satyam Apriyam, do not speak the truth if it is not loving. So how are you going to apply this and answer my question? Now, where I don't want to go into the answer here, but that, that really engenders, oh, wait a minute, I have to not lie? <laughs> yes, you can't lie. Oh, but I have to not make you upset. Yes, you have not make me upset. <laughs> okay, so it's it's just a good way to have a conversation about, look, yeah, you have to apply the values in simple situations in life. And then, you know, we do a community leadership activity, right? In the past, the, ch the children may have uh, participated in service projects in the center. Probably all group one, group two, group three do that. But this is different. We are saying, no, you have to proactively understand, hey, what is there a need in the community? Okay, yes, there is a need. There is some homelessness. There is some this and that. Okay, great. What are you going to do about it, right? Oh, I have to do some research. Oh, there's some nonprofits that are helping those, those people out. Okay, how can we support that? And I, I'm, not, I'm not telling them what to do. I'm just asking questions, right? And so... And they will end. They will. They are very creative. They will find the right person. They'll find an email address on the internet. They will talk to that person. They'll email. They'll come back and say, "Oh, yeah, we can do this, right?" And then, great. Oh, well, how are you going to do it? When are you going to do it? And then they form a team. And then they will divide up responsibility. And then actually execute on the project. So just being there for them, as opposed to telling them what to do, uh, is is a is a cool thing. In fact. In Seattle, you must have heard about this tiny homes project. And some of the group four kids, yes, that was a center project already happening. I said, okay, what are you gonna do uh, about that? So the tiny homes actually go into a village community of 40 homes, and then it's a transitional home. That means uh, they take a homeless person off the streets, four months they are in this village, and four months later they are, they are moved into a more permanent uh, housing. But that village has needs. So they went to that village and they discussed, hey, what do you need? And they said, okay, this is all we need. And then they did a project in the center. They actually collected what was needed. They went and delivered there and so on and so forth. This is an example. Very, very inspiring to see the kids do it. Uh, now, you know, this is a question that I, I ask myself. Like, for example, everything here is what we are doing in SSE. Yes, you have to. Do meditation. Yes, you have to study science literature. You have to apply values and you have to do community leadership projects. This is all what. 
And even we can talk about how we should do this. How, did you, how should you study Sahaja literature? How should you, you do a meditation? How should you apply? All that's great. The what and how, we're all experts. Everybody gets it, I think, as teachers. But fundamentally, we have to go back to why are we even doing this thing, right? Uh, I got four minutes. And uh, so, and in terms of why we're doing this, it goes back to Swami's question. Uh, we have to realize we are God. And I tell, I tell this to uh, Swami's uh, answer here. Uh, you can you can read it, but the, but this really raises a bunch of questions in the kid. What what what? My I am divine. I am God. You know what does that all mean? Then I go into Prashnotravahini chapters two and chapter seven, uh, which talks about the spiritual anatomy of the human being. It talks about the five elements. Talk about how the how the five elements have created these four bodies: the gross body the subtle body, the gross body, the intuition of the gross body is, let me go all the way to the end here. Um, the, in, the, the food, the, the gross body is divided into, is called the food sheet. Uh, then the subtle body is divided into these three sheets. The intuition of the subtle body is a dream state, right? where the limitations of the physical body are not evident. Uh, you can be in India without getting on a plane, for example. And it's divided into these three sheets, the vital air, mental, and intellect sheet. And this mental sheet is where the whole world is synthesized. On the one side you have, uh, on, on the one side of the intellect sheet, you have the changing world. On the other side of the intellect sheet, you have the constant bliss. So the intellect is correctly positioned to identify what is changing and what is not. And unfortunately, what Swami says is our awareness is limited to the outer sheets. So therefore, we are literally either human or subhuman. <laughs> it's in that boundary that we are. If we are purely a victim of senses, we are subhuman. If we allow the intellect to uh, operate you know, a little bit, then we are human. But Swami says you have to increase awareness to understand that you're even more than the intellect that you're divine. So every activity that we do, um, you know, you can call it meditation, service projects, and all this is to help us increase our awareness. And the last thing I'll say is the super causal, which is that light that we talked about in meditation, is nothing but the five values. And by manifesting the five values in thought, word, and deed, we are just forcing, forcing our awareness, right, to connect and increase and expand our awareness to, to, to realize that we are that divinity in us. So manifesting the super values, which is what... Uh, Educare is all about, is essentially bringing out this divine light, this permanence that we have in us through all of our five sheets, through our, through our words, through our actions, and through our thoughts, is what somebody calls expansion or complete self-awareness. So I spent two or three hours on this in the beginning. So we lay a foundation so they don't question, we, uh, this is why we're doing it. Right? And this is something we take it on face value, right? I don't have a scientific proof about, you know, about this. We take it on face value. And there's no, we don't ask any questions. This is, this is why we are here. And then the last thing is, you know, the parent connect. It's an important uh, aspect of SSC. You know, I remember... You know, uh, I was in an interview room with Swami with, with my kids and my mother was very proud. And she said, you know, Swami, they go to Baumikas in America. And uh, Swami said, ah, once a week. <laughs> he just was very dismissive of it. So what they do at home very, is very important. So this parent connection is very important. This is from a discourse in July 21, 2008. Ideal parents raise ideal children. You should all read that discourse. Uh, some of your parents as well. So obviously, Swami wants parents to practice values. 
Um, and then Swami says, children also have a responsibility to parents. So this is a very important relationship. And this chart here, which I'm obviously not going to go through the time we have, uh, is inspired from that discourse. Uh, it talks about how parents could help uh, in, 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 in uh, helping the children understand how to apply human values. Earlier on, group one, group two, parents are simply demonstrating through their actions what they want their children to do. The parents should do what they expect the children to do. You know, group two, group three, you know, parents should be actually explaining to the children why they are making the decisions they are making and how they are applying values in those decisions. They can still make the decisions for the children, but they should explain why. I think group three, group four, somewhere here, we ask the children, hey, ask your parents if you have any questions or doubts about whether this is the right or wrong decision, consult with them, right? Maybe you can still make, now you, maybe you make your own decision, but at least consult with them and take your advice. And then the last one is, parents need to realize that children will come to them less and less and less, right? As they go to college, as they go to, and, and become independent, and parents should be comfortable with that. But children should realize that they have to serve their parents. Their identity cannot be just about me. It, it's about their family. It's about their values, their culture, and so on. And this is a relationship that continues lifelong. I, I still talk to my father. I still ask his opinion and advice on things to this day. So that's all I had to share. And I'm, I'm happy to send this slide over. There's a lot more here, but Vashanotravani, chapters two and seven, please read that. Sign up. Byron, wow, that was um, very insightful. Thank you so much. Um, I think we are all just taking it all in um, as we many of us are just kind of getting back in from the summer and starting our SSC classes. Um, this is really good information um, that you've uh, shared with us. Um, for for all of those um, you know on the call, please do put your uh, questions in the chat, and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. Um, one question I have is, um, you know, with the number of students that you've had over the years, have you had any students that have um, gone through your uh, gone through group four and and passed your test and um, have come back to you to share with you maybe some situations that your that your class has has helped them through? So you you touched on many things um, such as you know, the decision-making framework and, um, you know, nine paths of devotion, all these things. Do you have any examples that you can share of, of where these were actually put into, into the, into the real world? Yeah, I'll tell you a couple of examples. One student who is still a student in my class, uh, he has decided to be um, a civil engineer and wants to spend his professional life building low cost housing. Thanks to the uh, tiny homes project. Right. Uh, you know, as an example, another student who is uh, now married <laughs> and she is a professional uh, and all that, you know, she was having a challenge, you know, uh, in her life, you know, especially in her professional life. And she reached out to me and we had a wonderful conversation about values and, you know, hey, patience, you know, uh, Swami uh, is there. And, you know, this this idea of faith being a true sort of stress reliever, right? Uh, you know, so, so reinforcing that notion, hey, Swami has a plan for you. You know, you're going to end up in the right place. You know, you just have to keep doing what you're doing. The right things will happen. Um, so, you know, that is another example, right? Where the, the she, you know, she reached out and we had a great one-hour SSE class. <laughs> she, she's in her 30s right now. Right, so it's it's a uh, it's 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 uh, they they always do come back, uh, and you know the study of Sai literature and reinforcing that is uh, is a good thing. Yeah, it, it doesn't ever seem to end, or, as it shouldn't. It it shouldn't. I mean, our everyday world is our constant, you know, SSE uh, class, and that's how we should we should kind of uh, uh, approach it. 
Um, we, we have a question here. Um, the question is, um, some children get overwhelmed with extracurricular activities and academics during group four um, and prioritize maybe other activities over SSC. How do we keep them connected and motivated to be involved in SSC? Look, there are, there are two things here. One is there are some just physical issues in terms of you know uh, overlapping times or overlapping projects and so on. That you'll have to figure out. You'll have to just work with the students, understand what's some optimal time and all that. But more importantly, the second issue is it's a symptomatic of a lack of understanding of the value that SSE brings to their lives. So you have a responsibility, we all have a responsibility to um, you know, explain to them, right? That, you know, how is this actually valuable to you? Yes, you want to be do great in your academics, but by the way, SSC is going to make you great in your academics. Or oh, you want to do great in your, I don't know, lacrosse tournament. Guess what? SSC is going to make you great in that. I mean, they need to see that connection, right? Otherwise, it's just a, oh my God, do I have to come to this class and read some text which I don't even understand? So this is why it is so important to really connect the things they're doing and how SSC can help that, right? It, it's it's absolutely important to them. Um, that's um, excellent. I think we, I, I probably speak for many of us, we hear that at lots of different um, age groups, not only group four, and sometimes I think connecting that why is, is so important. Um, we, we, well, I, I'd like to add one more thing, Sujata, is that, you know, we do a commencement day, right? I'm sure everybody does it, right? And uh, one of the things that happens at commencement day for graduating group four kids, they all have, get to share, speak, almost like a valedictory speech, right? And they start in front of all the other kids, right? In the center, right? And and it's important. And you, you know, it's, it's incredible to see, especially the group three kids, they just start looking up to these group four kids that are graduating, right? And when they see that, you know, these are all ways in which you have to build up the value of SSE. Right, there are different ways, different opportunities. Get the students to talk. How did they? How did SSC help them? You know, to others, other kids. Use center opportunities to have those conversations and discussions. You have to build up the value of SSC. It's it's there. You just have to make it obvious. It's not like a one-time thing. It's a constant effort. Yeah. Sometimes hearing from their close uh, uh, students that are close to their peers sometimes is, is very impactful, uh, I, I, I've, I've noticed. Um, let's see, um, some, some more questions uh, coming in. Um, uh, there was one question about what was the duration of your tiny home project and can you please tell more about that? I, I, how much time do I have? <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I, can tell, I can tell a lot about it. Uh, the tiny homes project look it's um it's um I, i'm going to share a, a picture of my uh, of uh i'm i'm very uh, sort of proud of this my my this is this person is this is the ssc kid from my our class right he's out there you know painting and building this tiny home right this is one of the parents of a group for kids Right. This is uh, one of the group uh, group two SSE teachers. Right. We're all here building homes. Another another SSE kid. This is uh, our SSE coordinator Tejaswini. Right. In our center. So we're all doing stuff. Once so we go once a month, and uh, you know the interesting part about this is that uh, they have a low sort of within like. 30 minutes, if you're for the coming there for the first time, you know what to do. You can cut lumber, you can paint, you can do so many other things. And they'll teach you, you can caulk, uh, whatever it is, right? And then you spend about four hours uh, once a month. And we've been doing this for like four years now. Um, 
so thousands and thousands of hours. And, uh, and you know, the, each home is an eight by 12 home and uh, it costs $4,000 to build a home. There's, you know, $4,000 is the cost of materials. And then the actual labor is, is free because everybody's volunteering. And then a village is, is, consists of 40 homes. And there are two nonprofits. One is building and one is managing the village. Um, and then the way it works, as I said, you'd get the homeless person on the street into a home. They stay in the home for four months. And then in four months, they are able to find that person a more permanent housing solution. That's that's how it works. And the goal is by next year, which, which happens to coincide with Swami's 100th birthday, there'll be enough of the standing homes that there'll be no homeless people on the streets of Seattle. So that's that's the goal. Wow, absolutely incredible. Um, I know that we have some more questions, but I know we're also right at time. So um, so what we'll do is I will hopefully be able to maybe share some of those questions with you and perhaps if you have have a chance, maybe you can shed some light on some of the, the last few questions that came through. Um, but but I must say on on behalf of all of us, thank you so much for sharing. I mean, we we just kind of took a, a break for summer and now we're all coming back. And what a lovely way to kind of start back and, and fresh with our SSC school year. Um, it's a it's a true delight, and and I don't think any of us take it lightly. What a blessing it is to have you share um, your your insight with us and and um, help us along as we as we try to share uh, Swami's message um, with with our students. Um, so thank you very much, and for everybody on the call, um, our next session is October twenty third. So you will get more information on that um, in the coming weeks. But uh, thank you for. For uh, for attending and 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 sharing your your wonderful thoughts. Yeah.